Good morning. Um, thank you all for uh, coming out this morning, and I'm very grateful for Asian Banker to invite me to, to share with you a few thoughts about engineering smarter cities and fintech. So wh why are we talking about smart cities? I thought this was a, a future of finance conference. Well, more than 50% of the world's populations lives in a city today. And by 2050, about two-thirds of the world's population is going to live in a city. You cannot talk about the future of finance without talking about the environment in which people are transacting in cities. So we're going to talk today about collaboration and data analytics, um, which we think we need both in order to carve this new future. So big idea number one. I'm going to throw out a few ideas today. In fact, uh, there's, a, there's an expression that uh, at MIT's president in the 1970s, Jerry Wiesner, who, who then helped found the, the Media Lab, said that an MIT education is like a drink from a fire hose. Uh, and the students responded by taking a fire hydrant, chaining it to a water fountain, and embedding it in concrete. And that was one of the more famous hacks on campus. Uh, uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the MIT fire hose today. So we're going to go fast, we're going to cover a lot of ideas, uh, and hopefully leave you with some inspiration. So big idea number one, um, how ideas flow through a city predicts GDP. We looked at over 200 cities in, the U in, in North America and Europe, and this holds true that if I know the rate of idea flow in a city, if I know uh, uh, sort of how the pattern of phone calls, so this is aggregate data analysis, I can tell you the GDP trajectory of that city or neighborhood. Uh, in fact, there's only one city out of all these 300 cities that we analyzed where there's a high rate of idea flow and a low rate of economic productivity. So what's that one city? Shout it out. Tell me, what do you think is the one city where there's a high rate of idea flow and a low rate of economic productivity? I know some of my former students are here in the room, and I'm going to start picking on you if you don't throw out some answers here. Anyone? Muhammad? Take a guess. What's one city? A lot of ideas, not much economic productivity. Boston. No, curious. Boston should be the answer, but it's not. Boston actually does have a lot of, of uh, startups and established businesses. Washington, D.C. So, <laughs> there it is. Um, so, big idea number two. There are 1.5 billion people in the world who lack a legal identity. Identity is the on-ramp for financial inclusion. How can we offer banking services and mobile banking and payments, all sorts of stuff, if we don't know who they are? Identity today is deeply flawed. So, so the way that we get identity is our, our parents you know, give birth to us, and, and they tell some doctors, yes, yes, they're, they're really our parents, and the, the doctors talk to the government, and in my case, the US government issues me some paper that says I'm me. This model is very flawed. It's centralized, it's easily forged, and, and the, the costs of compliance are astronomical. Uh, uh, around identity. So uh, we all here uh, uh, probably deal with AML and KYC issues. Uh, I remember reading recently that uh, Citibank, uh, Citigroup, uh, had a very successful cost-cutting initiative that cut over $3 billion US uh, through, through layoffs and automation and all sorts of stuff, and they spent all of it on compliance, mostly dealing with AML and KYC. Our identity systems are not keeping up with the world that we're living in. But that mobile phone that you carry around with you is actually a really powerful tool for robust identity, for cyber secure identity. So we'll talk about that a little more. Something that we spent a lot of time thinking about at MIT is an operating system for smarter cities and a smarter financial system. And now I'm going to take you through what that means. This is a picture from our research group in uh, 1996. It probably looks like what you think of when you think of MIT students. Um, so what they were trying to do here is, as back then, now remember, in the, in the early 1990s, 
computers were, you know, about the size of this speaker here, and, and, and even laptops were, you know, the size of a substantial briefcase. But the trend was getting smaller and smaller. And there was a vision that someday, that someday we would have these wearable devices and little computers that you could hold in the palm of your hand uh, that would tell us more about the world around us. So we wanted to simulate that. So, so here, you know, the batteries were big, so you had to actually strap a motorcycle battery to your waist to power the electronics. And they put on like a mining helmet and a video camera. And then they tried to have the computer tell them what was going on around them. They called themselves the, the Cyborg Collective. Uh, in fact, the guy there uh, went on to invent Google Glass. Um, and in 1995, uh, we were visualizing what the future would look like with these little wearable devices that now everyone's got, you know, a smartphone. How many of you have like an Apple Watch or a, or a smartwatch? Yeah, so, so these wearables are starting to come into our lives. Um, and so this led to a new discipline called social physics. Because once we had these devices on people and we began to be able to measure sort of how they were moving around a city and how they were interacting with each other, we found that there were predictive equations, that there was math that could describe what was going on, what people were going to do, and how to influence it. And this is really like big stuff because, you know, before that, um, the, the science of understanding people was, was sort of relegated to the soft sciences and, you know, they called it sociology and, and it didn't really provide anything useful and so people made a lot of guesses. So there's a famous expression in the advertising industry, for example, you know, I waste 50% of my advertising spending, uh, I just don't know which 50%. Because the understanding of people was so poor. Now, there's new math, social physics, which can tell you what people are doing, what they're going to do, and, and how that interacts in a society. Uh, so, so Forbes called uh, uh, Sandy Pentland, the inventor of the science professor at MIT, uh, one of the seven most powerful data scientists on the planet because of this discovery, this social physics. So the curious thing is the ideas behind it were a couple hundred years old. So, so how many of you studied you know, economics, like Adam Smith in school? You, know, you heard about the invisible hand, you know, this idea that, that each of us individually are selfish and we act in our own self-interest, but somehow when we interact in the market together, we miraculously sort of move in a direction that, that creates sort of a stable market environment. Um, people forget that Adam Smith actually was not talking about selfish self-interest. He also said that people are doing all these activities that they're doing for collective good that they're engaging in trade for collective benefit, that, that there's this concept of collective intelligence. Now the problem was back you know, in the 1700s, he didn't have the math, he didn't have the computers to be able to, to really uh, prove that out. But now we do. In fact, we, we figured out how to calculate the incentives necessary to get a group of people to do stuff uh, uh, for societal benefit. So what this leads us to is the ability to create an operating system for, for smart cities, for smarter societies, and for a smarter financial system. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in detail in a minute. Right now, I'm just going to briefly take you through some of the principles of this operating system. So we need a robust digital identity because that's how we get people into the system. Um, we need distributed trust. So if we had a, a robust identity and we had distributed trust authorities, we could lower the cost of AML KYC by three orders of magnitude. Think about that for a minute. Think how much your banks and non-bank finance companies spend on AML KYC. By using open algorithms, we can now unlock the power of data analytics and make data available for sharing and for societal good without invading privacy without releasing personal information that people want to keep protected. Um, I'm not going to go into distributed secure computation now, I'll just say there's cool math and neat computer programs that can make this all possible. Uh, and it's really important that we include everybody. The risk of all this great technology is that we're going to leave even more people behind. Universal access is important. So uh, we have Accenture, Intuit, Microsoft, 
the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the French government, several others working with us on building this new operating system that we call the, the Trust Data Operating System. So, so there's more on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this now, but if you go to trust.mit.edu, uh, there's more information about this. Um, so what can we do with this? Right? So now we get to the exciting part, because uh, that, that we're, we're not just fascinated by technology. Our mission at MIT is to solve the world's greatest problems through technology. And, and so it's the impacts that we care about. Uh, in the region, we've been looking at the questions of youth unemployment and how can we use data analytics uh, and, and the science of idea flow to improve employment. Um, we can improve transportation, uh, which in turn can improve GDP. Uh, so we've been able to work with a, a city of about 5 million uh, by looking at information flows, by looking at telecoms data, we helped improve everyone's commute time by 10%. Uh, we can manage scarce resources. So there was government in, in Europe that wanted to reduce electricity utilization because below a certain level, uh, they could go all hydroelectric, above a certain level, they'd turn on diesel generators. And so by using social incentives, uh, that was a little like dancing bear that would appear on your, your electricity bill every month when you went to pay it, um, they were able to get everybody to use 17% less electricity. And the way they did that was that if they didn't incentivize you with those little dancing bears, they incentivized your neighbor. So if you used less electricity, he would get little marmots dancing on his screen at the end of the month. Um, it seems silly, but it actually works. People care about what other people think, and it motivates behavior. So of course, why not water? Any resource could be managed with these methodologies. Uh, you can use it for tourism. We're re-engineering the economy of Andorra which is this fascinating little country in the Pyrenees between France and Spain. Uh, it's got 80,000 residents and 12 million visitors annually. So their entire economy is driven by visitors. And you can use data analytics to make that experience much more pleasant. And so now we go from smarter cities to smarter fintech. So we do our experiments on creating these, these smarter data-driven environments uh, both virtually in, in digital trading systems as well as physically in urban environments. Um, so, for example, uh, we took a day trading network of, of 5 million currency traders and by optimizing how they got trading ideas, how they came up with ideas for how to trade uh, currency derivatives, we were able to improve everybody's ROI in the entire market by 50%. We took our online class, so I teach a class, uh, uh, MIT's FinTech class online, and, and we've gone into 130 countries. And so we took this global audience of students, and we were able to use this, this group to predict the closing price of the stock market. Now, prediction markets as an idea have been around for a while. Uh, this was really exciting, like 10 years ago, people got excited about them, they said, oh, the internet's connecting everybody, now we can predict things, and it turns out that if you just take the averages, uh, it doesn't work very well. It's plus or minus 5%, which is maybe great for, for sort of a parlor trick, but it doesn't actually let you make intelligent trading decisions. So if you just do the sort of wisdom of the crowd, um, you got a bit of an error bar around your prediction. If you just take the experts, people who are really good at making predictions, um, you basically get them disagreeing with each other. Because part of what makes an expert an expert is they stake out an opinion. And over time, they get pushed to stake out more and more extreme opinions. Uh, so Nate Silver wrote a wonderful book called The Signal and the Noise, and he talks about this, this effect in more detail. What we found is that if you tune the market, if you put a little more weight on the experts, but not a lot, you can predict the closing price of the S&P 500 within 0.1%. Uh, so this is unpublished data, but uh, we are going to be putting out a paper on this in, in the near future. Um, you also can use these predictive sciences, the social physics, to come up with a better credit score. Let's think about this. The models of, of credit risk that we manage our institutions with uh, are, are 50, 60 years old. We're using linear regression modeling that's what a credit bureau does. They gather all your credit history, they put it into a big database, and then you extrapolate forward and you say, past prediction is, uh, past results uh, are a prediction of future results, and anyone who lived through the 2008 financial crisis knows that that's not true. 
So we use mobility and communications and other behavioral data to build a better credit score. In fact, 30 to 50 percent better than what banks are using today. And when I say build a better credit score, I don't mean this was in some labs as a computer. I mean we work with a real bank uh, in, in a, a predominantly uh, Muslim country, uh, uh, shall remain nameless, and, uh, and we were able to figure out uh, how people moved around the city and how that related to their financial behavior. So that, that we actually spun out into a, a company uh, called Distilled Analytics. So now let's get to the what ifs. All right, I've just taken you through a bunch of different ideas about how we can use collaboration and data analytics to, to, to engineer better cities. So, so what does that look like for the region? So what if uh, we had a laboratory for new FinTech? If we could take the city and turn it into this vibrant experimentation environment where you could try out new ideas. So that would require the regulator, industry, academia, innovators, all working together in this living lab for FinTech. What if Dubai unlocked Africa? So here's an interesting fact. Uh, so there, there are about a billion uh, mobile communications lines now in Africa. Uh, there are over 200 million smartphones already deployed in the continent, and, and there are going to be about 500 million smartphones in Africa within three to five years. That's going to change everything. And Dubai and the UAE are rather uniquely positioned to, to be an enabler of that economic development. Africa is the last frontier market. It is a huge opportunity to drive economic prosperity and progress. And, and the UAE has a, a, a very interesting position to, to help facilitate that. What if Dubai connected a constellation of FinTech cities? What if the location here is able to serve as a bridge between all the great stuff going on in Singapore and Hong Kong and Vietnam and elsewhere in the Asia region and Shanghai with the activity going on in London, in Amsterdam, in New York, in Mexico City, in Sao Paulo. There are some tremendously exciting opportunities and I am thrilled to be alive at this time. Thank you.